everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 568, recording today, uh, Wednesday, <laughs> the 20th of February, 2019. Uh, yes, I've got a new mic. I tried it last week and I actually quite like it. This is the uh, new Rode Pod mic, which is a little smaller, very heavy thing, but it's got quite a, quite a bright and uh, present sound for a dynamic mic. So that's what I'm on today. And I think I might stick with that because I do like the sound of it. Um, yes, I uh, want to say thank you very much to uh, Isotope for bringing us the show uh, prior. This week is going to be RX-7 once again. Uh, we'll details of on that a little bit later. And also, um, before we get started, I wanted to mention we've done a deal with Synthplex. Uh, Synthplex, uh, uh, the big show that's happening uh, March 28th at uh, uh, in Burbank, LA, at the Marriott Convention Center. If you want to get tickets for that, we got a 20% discount code uh, up until March the 15th. So if you're thinking of going and haven't bought tickets yet, uh, which is synthplex.com, uh, if you use the uh, the URL uh, bit.ly slash synthplex and enter the code SONICSTATE20, I think that's a capital S and no spaces, so SONICSTATE20, the number 20, uh, that'll get you 20% off till March the 15th. So do check that out. They've uh, just announced uh, recently, I think there's... The banquet on the Saturday night. I don't think you get a discount on the banquet because, I mean, that's fixed costs with uh, uh, dinner and whatnot. Uh, I think um, Thomas Dolby's playing there. They've got a whole bunch of um, really interesting media composers coming in and talking about kind of synthesis of electronic music in the creative process of writing to picture, all of that stuff. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. So save 20% uh, synthplex with the Sonic State 20 code. Right, let's get on to the main thing. Let's say hello to everybody. We'll start off with Mr. Jamie Liddell, who is there uh, somewhere hello. in uh, in America. I haven't had you on for ages, Jamie. What have you been up to? It's good. Um, well, the usual, been writing bunch of stuff mostly for other people um a lot of la trips been busy with the podcast and you know that's been going great i've got a lot of crazy guests coming up just had a new one so out look, very Paul recently Ross was your last yes he's amazing he's great wow that's yeah a load of good he's stuff great guests. yeah oh oh just lost yeah that's one that forget Paul again. Webb from Talk Talk. Um, oh, I, right. I, I nice. wrote to Gaz about that actually because I didn't even know that much about Talk Talk to my shame. But um, Paul Webb was on the show and he's amazing. It took him 15 years to do his album. Oh my Somehow God. it puts everything into kind of an amazing perspective. Just like, you know, we rush around, but it took Paul 15 years and he was happy about it, you know. That's it's the way he wanted time. to do it. Well, that's okay if you can yeah. if you if you can keep yourself alive in the meantime. That's pretty good. <laughs> I was so close to the album. Yeah, no, exactly. No, so uh, you know, just keeping busy, bringing up the bringing up the three year old and uh, traveling. We're traveling. That's why we're in Santa Fe at the moment. We're doing a little family jaunt. Nice. Which is pretty adventurous because it's like all snowy and crazy, but still, we are here. That sounds fun. Good to well, be back. Uh, good to have you. Uh, actually, I don't, yeah. if we're talking about interesting producers, there was a documentary on Sky Arts, which is a UK channel. I don't know if you get that in the States. Uh, and it was all about XTC. And it was absolutely brilliant. Oh. And 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 uh, XTC seemed to be a kind of bit of a hidden secret for a lot of people. I mean, they're quite um, yeah. nutty British kind of uh, eccentrics, but their pop music is amazing. I mean, they're so talented and uh, really unusual, but well worth a watch uh, if you're interested in that sort of, you know, rockumentary style thing, which Andrew Partridge was very dismissive of. He goes, oh God, I've said something that people always say in rockumentaries, it's all over. You know? <laughs> but he's a very funny <laughs> bloke. It's really, really good. Really, really good. So I, I'm uh, well cool. worth checking out. Can't remember what it was called. Uh, anyway, let's also mm -hmm. have a, a hello to Mr. Matthew Hodson. Uh, Matt Hodson over there um, in Brighton, uh, where he's uh, right. master. He's at the controls of a massive modular system, where he's uh, doing his thing as well as working over yeah. the BIM. Where he's I've got no idea right. how it works. Yeah. I just I just sit in front of it most of the time and pretend I know what it does. <laughs> That's often the way, though, isn't it? You're supposed, yeah. to, you're, you're not supposed to let us find out. That's that. That's supposed to be your creative secret, isn't it? That's the thing that we all worry about. People are going yeah. to find out that we're frauds. Right. Exactly. Actually, I've just been beta testing a module that's not out yet. I can't. I've just had to whip it out of the rack. That's why I've got some gaps here because uh, I can't show it on screen. But it's it's something that does really fancy chord generation and um, melodic content. It's called the Symphonian, 
and uh, it's due out pretty soon. There's a, there's a few few modules, few videos already on YouTube about it from the from the, the maker. Um, but it's oh man, it's absolutely fab for those of you that are into less bleepy bloopy modular synth stuff like me. Um, I'm into more melodic stuff. This is great. It does polyphony. Just, it, it's a shocker, it does isn't it? it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it doesn't make the sound, but it generates the chords <laughs> and and the the note content. It's really great. Um, and there'll be some videos coming out for that soon. Excellent. It's really Excellent. good. Well, glad to yeah. hear Yeah. Well, good. Thanks. Oh, good. And uh, we also have Mr. Mark Tinley, who's uh, who's not looking ill, but he sounds like he's got a really nasty cold. Uh, they're in Glastonbury where he I've managed done the some clever medication. <laughs> clever medication. Is it all legal, I'm sure? It, it is all legal, yeah, including uh, all the hippie stuff like... like uh, colloidal silver whatever the hell that is but my wife told me to go and get it so i've just drank loads of that it says it's antibacterial Hopefully that looks work. like it's got a spray on it are you sure you're supposed to drink it <laughs> oh no oh, really <laughs> she said drink it i've drunk oh, okay. it <laughs> no I've, I've heard that silver's supposed to be very curative and you're i'll tell you well if i die before the end of the podcast we'll know what's happened right <laughs> oh, please don't it's yeah. a suppository isn't it it's it's a anyway well mark how's, anyway how's yeah, so i'm not in the shop today <laughs> how's life in the Sorry. shop you, you've got a new shop have you moved into the new premises i haven't yet? moved to the new shop yet um life in the shop i haven't been in the shop all week it's really distressing i've been uh, i have actually been really ill um i've got a lung infection and that means that if i kind of run around trying to do anything i just run out of breath really quick oh no and it's really frustrating because i want to go to the shop and do stuff <laughs> um <laughs> apart from that yeah it's very amusing as always and i've been having loads of fun um I, i'm not really I, and i'm not really in retail i've realized i think i'm in comedy actually because <laughs> i was talking to my son about this my son came in the other day wearing something truly outrageous which he bought off amazon and i looked at him and i went oh my god what are you doing and then he said um dad can i come in the shop and we'll have a conversation that will go like this and i got really enthusiastic and we did this whole role play back and forth and we worked out what the script <laughs> was going to be and everything and then i thought hang on that's what i'm actually up to in that shop it's got nothing to do with pe selling people things i'm just in there to like throw banter back and forth at people so well that sounds like fun uh, nothing wrong with that yeah exactly yeah which is why i don't think it will ever uh, it will ever lead to work in the retail sector anywhere else well, as long as you're sure that uh, it's worth having a larger shop, because I mean, if, but based on those those particular criteria, I don't I, want you, you to know, overreach yourself. Well, the reason I'm doing it is because it has an upstairs and it has a, a place for an office and a workshop. Ah, yes, I remember. And, you I said, want, yeah. and I've been going on about this for about two or three years, maybe more. I want to start a charity that changes the way they, that uh, some of the really good musicians in this. Uh, area receive funding and i want to create like mentorship schemes and ways that people can get patronage patronage if i said oh, that right, right. Like, the, like the old Not days yeah and then like basically create like a, a um you know a a a proper charity with a bank account where where people who want mm. to support these musicians can put money and then the upstairs area can have like a, a showcase area or a, somewhere I can do an exhibition of that is still musicians work. Um, so downstairs will continue to be a music shop, but upstairs will start that channel thing. Growing empire. That sounds really interesting. Fantastic. And then I'm going to do the grown up thing, which is work out how to employ people because I'm not very good at that. And I usually <laughs> end up firing people in really bizarre circumstances. And in fact, we got... We had a new cleaner on Monday who was coming for an interview and I've managed to fire her before she's even got here. So I really shouldn't be responsible for anybody's uh, employment. You need all. an a HR but officer. It needs to, um, it needs to be that if I'm ill, like I have been this week, that the whole place doesn't just shut down. And that if other people are working there and they, and, and it has an independent kind of existence. Yeah, so no, just well, that's all big, all about me. It would be much I, better, I think. I can relate to that concept as a concept. Right, well, let's get on to a few uh, topics and whatnot. Uh, yeah, this was this was a bit of a shocker, isn't it? The uh, So the good old uh, Teenage Engineering OP1 is back. Uh, rem I don't know if you remember, there was actually an ad a while back where uh, Teenage Engineering sort of showed an eBay uh, 
posts saying, look how outrageous the, the prices that these are going for. And then they, they, they've they sort of resourced it and are building it. But actually, bizarrely, are charging pretty much the same as that outrageous price was um, was in the ad. So we're, there, there seems to be a bit of a hoo-ha about this, but uh, they cite uh, the reasons of... Uh, uh, currency conversion, inflation, sourcing of new components, recoding display, redesign the mount, but it's almost double the price. And I know a lot of people swear by the OP1. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember, Jamie, if you're an OP1 uh, um, uh, devotee, but uh, it's hard to remember because there's so many. You're not, are you? And presumably you won't I mean, be. If someone, if someone, yeah, if, if one fell into my hands, I would, uh, I would use it. But I've got enough small things that go woo. And, you know, and uh, not big things that kind of wobble. So, yeah, uh, it, it's awesome. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, when I've used it, I've thought this is quality. And it clearly, quality. It, I mean, that's the thing. You pay for quality, but it does seem a little excessive. Um, I feel people's pain. But um, it's just, I don't it know. It seems like a Maybe badly managed can. situation, given, given, given that yeah. they, you, they used the outrageous price in a previous ad to say, don't worry, it's coming back. But then charge yeah. this pretty much the outrageous price it seems a bit bad seems like it can't quite go well you know shame because it's such an awesome thing it is an awesome thing i don't know um matt whether you've uh you've done a bit of op1 action it's the sort of thing i'd imagine would um, appeal to you yeah i've had to play around with it before i mean because aesthetically the design of it it looks really great and the display and and what have you i've had a play around with them but it's it's too far removed from my workflow really this small device and the menu diving and it, it just took me forever just to get something quite basic going and, and maybe that's just because there's a bit of a learning curve with it but um sound quality and functionality is great you know it's just absolutely packed with all sorts of stuff effects sequences sequences um yeah uh, oscillators and what have you but uh but it's too removed from my way of working. I know a lot of, a lot of my mates have got it and they, they enjoy using it. Um, but f for me, it's, it's, it was just too small to get on with, really. Um, you know, and for that sort of price now, I think there's going to be there's going to be a lot of people who really wanted this that weren't able to get it because it wasn't available that are going to jump on this. But when you look at some of the things that have just come out in NAM recently, as you know, and, and the price points on some of these things and what, what you can get for that same price for a grand or under, you know, you can get yourself a couple of really nice monophonic synths that have just been announced by, you know, whether it's Behringer or whatever. Um, you could get yourself a small little modular rig. Okay, it wouldn't have the same functionality as that uh, OP1, but, um, but do you want, again, I'm not big on one of these one of these devices that does everything in one, you know, particularly when it's like that big and it's got everything in it. I'm, I'm quite into dedicated, uh, dedicated devices, right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I can, I can understand. Just two pence. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. I know, uh, Mark, I, I mean, they're, they're very desirable objects. I mean, I, I did an interview with teenage engineering, uh, at NAM and they were really, really nice people. I came away thinking, God, I wouldn't mind working for that company if I ever worked for anybody. It just sort of, they felt like a nice bunch of people, which is why this seems a little bit mm. kind of at odds with their whole vibe. I mean, I know a lot of people say, oh, it's all pretentious or whatever, but they're not. They're, they were really nice, seemed like really nice people. So it just seems like a strange move. But uh, I know, have you uh, have you ever had your hands on one? The only one I've seen is Gaz's one, actually. Yeah. And, um, and it is unbelievably cool what it does. And he showed, he well, you know, he's, infectious enthusiasm for things he showed it to me and i was just like okay, that thing is really awesome um i think it's set to become a, a future classic personally if at this rate because well, it's been going for it 10 back, years already it's nearly 10 doesn't years matter old. what the price point really is now does it old. yeah i, I mean that's what true. would you do would you rather buy a second hand one off ebay for 1100 pounds or would you rather buy a new one i think it's okay to want to buy a new one isn't it yeah, I and guess so. It just it feel. I think the problem is, is they said, "Don't pay this much for one. We're bringing it back, and then charge this much for one." Which is <laughs> that's that's the thing. That's the. Well, maybe they meant don't pay this much for a second hand one when you can have a new one for the same price. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, man. maybe. I think that's the bottom line on it is um, either the. But if you ask me the question, would I? Yes, they would said I they spend eleven hundred pounds on one? I probably wouldn't. No, not yet. 
Oh, is it via the chat room? Uh, let me see. I uh, see. Yeah, uh, uh, Sorry, Jam man. says, hey, Nick, I have an ELZ1 man. right here. It's going to be 409, which was the sort of uh, OP1-like thing, but not quite as beautiful, but similar sort of uh, layout and whatnot. But yeah, so um, but you can get them. They're back in stock now and will be for the foreseeable future. Um, I seem to remember they were made out of cnc magnesium. The actual... You know, it was like unibody. You know, it's really quite co high, it's high, and, the, and all the knobs and stuff. So, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe they ran down all their stock of what they could build and buying that stuff again. It's gone up enormous amount, but it seems it seems a shame if that's the case. But I guess they yeah. wouldn't compromise on the parts. I think that's it. They've, they've basically said, look, we could we could kill this and wipe, get rid of it completely, or you can have it, but it's just going to be a higher price. And I get that. And and if people are willing to yeah. pay that. Then, then wicked, you know, because it is it is a popular product, and there's a lot of people who are happy with it out there. So, nice one that they're offering it, and yeah. those hardcore fans. I can't fans imagine they're making that much money. I you don't. Know I mean? think, no. Are they really cleaning up and selling so yeah. many that people should be all angry and like these guys are ripping everyone off and making tons yeah. of money? You know, <laughs> are they really? Do you know what I'm saying? Like. Well, Seems like they an awful lot of R&D. Yeah, I could tell you that from uh, from the interview I did with them, they have 40 people working for them, and they just hired uh, a quite a big cheese from IKEA. So they poached one of the big IKEA product wow. manager people to come and work with them, and who I also spoke to. Um, so yeah, they're they're on a roll, and they do, but they do a lot of other things besides. But yeah, it just it doesn't look good. I suppose is the thing. It's the perception. Right, yeah, that's issue. true. That's true. true. Absolutely. True. Yes. True. Um, okay, well, uh, let's see. What else have we got? Uh, oh, yeah, this. Uh, there's absolutely no information other than, isn't it cool? This is a piece <laughs> of... Uh, this is basically a piece called Thor, T-H-A-W, not the god. Uh, and it's by a chap called Sean Costello, uh, who works for Valhalla. And apparently, I mean, as you know, Valhalla Reverb is... The Shimmer is an amazing and beautiful thing. And uh, this sounds like, th this is delay, and I think it's a shimmer delay, which also sounds particularly beautiful. But we have, we know it's coming, but we have no information other than this is what it sounds like when put to picture. But uh, it's funny, a, a lot of the comments in, uh, in this are sort of saying, you know, maybe I'm over a whole shimmer thing, you know, is shimmer kind of an overdone thing? Sometimes it's just, it, it just fits the bill beautifully. And if you're not doing short percussive, things it can really uh open out and uh, make you feel all lovely and warm inside and it does it's almost a genre i think shimmer it's like a sub-genre of what ambient i don't know maybe there is a maybe there even is an am ambient shimmer genre but yeah beautiful imagery i think it's some stock footage you got from somewhere as well but i suppose the question is um, how does one feel about the shimmer kind of thing? Because, I mean, I know um, for, for those of us who are perhaps not so musically gifted, um, it fills a lot of room. <laughs> with only a few in mm. notes are going in, you can end up with a little beautiful thing, and it does. it's, it's quite very emotive. Glastonbury. It's very Glastonbury. Yeah, I never used to be. It used to be more <laughs> as in Glastonbury electric. Town as opposed to Glastonbury Festival. As in, imagine yourself walking into <laughs> a beautiful yeah. Oh, garden. Yeah. It's, it's a relaxation tape breath. stuff, isn't it? Visualize yourself with pockets full of money and all that. <laughs> I mean, it reminds me of all that stuff on the high street. So, I mean, I like the sound of it though, personally, as well. So, maybe I've been hooked. Maybe that's why I live here. <laughs> maybe so, yeah. I don't know. I mean, like I say, it's very, it's like Valhalla DSP are the company and they make a lot of other stuff as well, but it's kind of cool. I know, Jamie, how you feel about, um, you know, textural stuff. I mean, I know you like to m mess and munge around with sound. I'm shimmering but you, now. And shimmering, but you often, often your your stuff is more, um, is, is less, uh, what am I looking for the word? It, it, it's less sort of floaty than than that, generally speaking. Thank you. More precise. Is that, is that a compliment? <laughs> I feel I, it I, must I, be. I try, I try to avoid the floaters, but it, it's basically, <laughs> um, I think it was invented by Eno, wasn't it? The, what, the, uh, the, the old AMS. It was the AMS, which is I should try to create it in the AMS because that's where it came from. I think. Eno used it's something else. Oh, did it? Eno used an SDR one thousand Ibanez reverb, and it has a hold button on the back of it. Oh. So you put something into it, it goes into the reverb, and you put your foot on the hold pedal, and it just holds it. So it's sort of like a hold but reverb SDR one thousand. But that's not shimmer; that's just a frozen reverb. But the actual feedback yeah. with the pitch change—that's the thing. I mean, I did a patch. Oh, like I angelic choir. Use, 
Yeah, I know I made a patch using the uh, Behringer XR18 where I created feedback loops and fed uh, chorus and a harmonizer back into a reverb and you can create this sort of shimmer stuff. So yeah, you may, yeah, you may yeah. well be right. It's the pitch and the verb and it's like some feedback loops of that. Yeah. Which, you know, makes me think one possibly ought to create kind of custom versions of effects chains to create your own shimmer. If you're a real shimmer connoisseur, you, you should probably try to work out how to make your own would be my advice to the shimmers. And I, I, hey man, a little shimmer here and there when you're looking for a proper ethereal, like waft. I, that's the show you know. title right there. Shimmer connoisseur. I think you've, you've got it. there, <laughs> Good work. I had to look at how to spell connoisseur there for a minute, but yeah, I got it at the end. Google helped. <laughs> Yeah, I, I suppose so. But I mean, in terms of but in terms of that, that, I mean, it's very easy to use these kind of washes of ambient sound, whether it be long reverbs or frozen stuff. And I know, I mean, it isn't granular, a similar kind of technique, really. I mean, isn't that sort of? I don't know whether no, that stuff gets more. It'll give you the same kind of ethereal um, rush. Uh, but I think, yeah, it, like you said, I mean, pop up, pop up on an aux, and then you know, off you go. You just all you got to do is bathe in, in you know the, the shimmery waters, yeah. And, uh, which is it, it, it's a little bit of a quick fix sometimes. But hey, you know, it, it was thing when when the Eventides first came out, you know, showing my age, whatever. But you know, you go into the fancy studios and go, oh man, trust Eventide, man. You know what I mean, because it was so crazy that it could do essentially these kind of things just off on orcs. And like I don't know, it's 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 amazing to have that much power with just one fader, essentially. Yeah, uh, well that's true. It's how you it's how you use the shimmer. It's it how is how you use the shimmer. I, I don't know. I mean, a modular and shimmer tend to go together, kind of you know, like oh, yeah. uh, peanut butter shimmer and jelly or whatever. On. Yeah, I was actually tempted to just um, stick this big sky, which has got shimmer on it, on on an aux on my vocal. Then, if if I had the choice. <laughs> I basically do this show every single time with my voice going through some shimmer reverb, basically, if I was allowed. Um, <laughs> well, you could, you could just do, I suppose the thing is you could just sort of go, uh, and that would be enough for about 10, 15 seconds, couldn't it? You know, so you could, you could, That's what that video might, was made from. I might, yeah, I might start a YouTube channel, which is just saying one word and then go through a shimmer for an hour or something. Um, actually, I did. Um, I do do some videos, which are called The Ambient Hour, which is a one-hour-long piece of ambient music um that is just made up on the spot which is a lot of uh shimmer and a lot of reverbs and that kind of stuff where i'm sort of jamming through the modular and time stretch stuff and granular stuff and yeah i use that all the time uh, i use it a lot when i'm writing stuff for TV. sorry jamie if you shimmer a shimmer what happens oh you mate you go black hole you you don't come out the <laughs> other side you you you're basking in the water. It's yeah. <laughs> Logarithmic sham. Yeah. Oh, oh, this does it pretty well as well. The Eventide um, pitch factor pedal. Yeah. It's got something like called crystals, which um, you've also got on the Sound Toys crystallizer kind of uh, plugin, which does kind of pitched delays and that kind of stuff, and you can get that sort of uh, shimmer going on with that. I love it though. Um, oh, I've got a couple of effects units here called the the Dervish. On this, this is uh, echoes and reverbs, and it's also got shimmer into it. You can program your own effects into there. So if you're interested in making your own shimmers and you're into there doing you know. a little bit of coding, you can download a bit of software, program well, your own shimmer, bit, yeah. stick it into that, and away you go. I love it. I use it I use it basically to put all my polyphony stuff through. So my chord generation stuff goes through that dervish as a stereo input and output, and it just gives you this lush pad side chain in that and it oh, just so you get the nice. rhythm yeah that makes a lot of sense so you're cutting it you're cutting it rhythm i would like to point out there what i have a practical use for shimmer i used it yesterday I, i'm being i'm doing the sound edits for my daughter's dance school ballet show and i what they they come to me with a load of cds with kind of various you know strauss whatever pieces that the kids are going to dance to with these really impossible edits and and sometimes the edits are so impossible you have to kind of stop it 
and then start, uh, you know, have a gap and have, you know, the next bit of music coming in a couple of seconds later that's on the beat. And ah. I did actually use the shimmer to fill the gap and it, it worked really well. And it was, you know, so it, it did have a purpose outside of the usual ambient. That was, that was purely mechanical and it just, it created enough harmonic space to make it sound like it was supposed to be like that. But I, yeah, so it, you it, it, it take does. that like, or you know, record like the dude on the train while well, the voice recording of Mind the Gap, and then shimmer that, and just always, just, <laughs> you know, that'd be a new experience in the tube. That would be terrifying. The gap, that, that, that would imply the gap is more of a chasm or a canyon, <laughs> something that you really do need to mind because it's so well, big and so deep exactly. and that you would get, never. <laughs> <laughs> shimmer always seems to imply the upward motion, but don't forget, shimmer can go down. And yeah. Maybe like for the shimmer connoisseurs have a name for that. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> it's, maybe you're right. you, know, you want to hope that there's there's some terms in the shimmer universe for all of these rapid and slow evolving. I'm sure things. there'd be a shimmer specialist Close. somewhere. When um, when that when you do shimmer, it's octaves, isn't it? So is it doing that barber pole thing where it's constantly rising and then comes back into itself? I think the the, the, the really good ones don't do it uh, infin inf infinitely. They just do a couple or you have a blend of octaves so it doesn't because it would just go so high that it, you know, and then I think there was, wasn't there the, uh, the Zenaptic did a, 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 a frozen or a shimmery that reverb that allows you to play after while they're that still going clever. it allows you to melodically shift the tail so that it doesn't get too smudgy as well that was a adaptive one. it was like an adaptive adaptive that that sounds like yeah. a good yeah. idea. that's a good that the, um, i mean that's what happens very pricey those plugins yeah They're good the, the big sky gives when you, you fits and octaves and um and you can go you can go up and down in like uh yeah fits thirds octaves two octaves and then down as well so oh, um, plenty oh, of you've got mini on that as well so you can you can transpose all of that but it's got two engines within it so you've got a shimmer going into a second shimmer so you can have one going down you could have Jeez. one then up on a fifth you can shimmer your shimmer all day long happy days yeah well that's all good stuff Excellent. anyway um uh, valhalla dsp uh, it's supposed to be coming quite soon it's going to be delay <laughs> Uh, I guess it would be called shimmer. We don't even know what it's going to be called shimmer delay, perhaps. I mean, perhaps it won't be. We're not entirely sure. Anyway, let's uh, let's take a quick break and uh, have a little word from our friends at Isotope, and then we can do the competition and whatnot. RX continues to be the industry standard and leader in audio repair for music and post-production. And with RX7, we've introduced groundbreaking new ways to quickly and easily fix and manipulate audio. Take the game-changing Repair Assistant, an intelligent helper that can detect noise, clipping, clicks, hum, and more. Also new in RX-7 is Music Rebalance, a powerful source separation tool. Drums too loud? Vocals not loud enough? Let's fix that. You can also create instrumental versions of songs by removing the vocal elements. You can now alter the pitch without affecting the timing of your audio, and conversely, Alter the time without affecting the pitch with the new variable time and variable pitch modules. Using the new dialog contour, you can improve the performance of a line or even create a new performance by altering the pitch contour of the dialog, therefore adjusting the intonation of the speaker. And introducing Dialog Dereverb, a module powered by machine learning to reduce the presence of reverberations around dialog. RX7, a new frontier in audio repair. And don't forget, you can download a demo of Isotope, uh, which will, if you just go to isotope.com and look out for uh, RX7, you can get hold of all of that good stuff. Uh, but if you wanted to enter a competition, uh, we also uh, will just get the, uh, the previous winner out of the way. Uh, last time we asked for uh, Mix Assistant and RX7, and we have somebody called, now I'm going to have really struggle with pronouncing this. <laughs> Blaz Furlik, I guess he may be uh, Slo yes, from Slovenia, so I'm sorry if I, uh, but your uh, handle is at Blaz, B-L-A-Z-F-R-L-I-C, Furlich maybe, I'm not sure, but if you want to get in touch, Blaz or Blaze or, yeah, as I say, terrible pronunciation, my Slovenian's not too hot, uh, you have won a copy of RX-7, so just get in touch, but if you want to... Uh, uh, enter for this week's competition. Uh, we're looking for the hashtag MagicDSP because that's what it is. Uh, in fact, I just published the um, 
uh, meet the makers with Mark Ethier, uh, and he's a really interesting chap uh, um, who's the CEO and founder of Isotope, if you want to check that out. But we're looking for the hashtag MagicDSP and the hashtag RX7 on Twitter to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. That's the hashtag MagicDSP, the hashtag RX7 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. Yes, indeed. So uh, what do we have next? Um, oh, yeah. This looks kind of cool. Anyone get the chance to see this? This was the... Um, it's a new Kickstarter. I'm going to take your tambourine and your drink to stage. Okay. Uh, All right, a... let's go to stage. <laughs> I started Alison working Tavel, for Grace Potter in 2012, and that's who's really the father when the resonator of, uh, the, started the, the daughter of Don Tavel. She did mention that her father had invented the synthesizer. I knew that he had invented yeah. some kind of synthesizer, but I didn't know much beyond that. I got into electronic music when it started up uh, pretty much in the 60s, and then I ended up inventing and holding seven patents on the precursor to MIDI. Ali said, the second we get off tour, I'm going to get the resonator. That was the beginning of the unraveling. So he invented a resonator, which is actually a pitch tracking, it's very I powerful was stuff at the time. My dad died in a car accident. Unfortunately, so passed away. I never got a chance to know him, and I never felt connected to him. The only memories I have of my dad are other people's memories. Those that knew him of Psych Beyond, oh, I don't think he ever would hurt himself. And I wasn't so sure. I got the resonator from my grandma's attic, and I found the man who originally built it for my dad back in the 70s. You want to try to make it work? He agreed to help me bring it back to life. I'm going to reach out to musicians who are inspired by this technology. This is the best way I know how to pay tribute to my dad and to continue his legacy. I think this is what my dad... Right, so basically, uh, this is a Kickstarter project. Um, the resonator was a really quite a powerful and unusual thing. It took pitch tracking and it applied resynthesis techniques and resonating techniques to the incoming, so you could play instruments into it. And this is remember, this is like the the the, the seventies, late seventies. So it's kind of really quite forefront technology, but sadly passed away. And his daughter is trying to make uh, a documentary to kind of just uh, cover just pay tribute to him and uh, she's got a kickstarter on the go uh, in fact has raised more than half the cash in an, in under five days so you know so yeah more than half the, in and 33 days to go so it looks like we might get to see it but it's an interesting piece of technology and it's like one of those it's one of the, i mean it's obviously a very sad story because she never really knew her dad she was under one years old when he passed away but how cool is that to have someone you know who was to have something like that to, to remember him by and kind of build this whole thing on. I don't know. Um, I know, Jamie, you're a big uh, sort of advocate of this sort of lesser known technology that uh, is this something that you already know about? I mean, do you have you heard of this thing? It's, it it's is. got a mythical status. Yeah, they actually reached out to me about this a long time ago. And I was just trying to find the emails. I, I wanted to prepare for this, but we that were rushing around this morning, so I couldn't dig out the emails. But yeah, I, uh, about, I want to say a couple of years ago, they, they reached out about this, and uh, I'm glad something has moved along. Um, yeah, I mean, great. These kind of bits of technology are just, yeah, as you say, right. I'd love to hear this thing in action. I mean, you know, it's sort of the family, in a way, to me, looks-wise, at least. We're losing, yeah, we're losing kind of, you a little bit there, Jamie. Uh, whether you're Dropbox, yeah, you're back. Well, you're, you're back. Yep, yeah, you're back. You're a back. little pixel. Yeah, it's an interesting device, bounce. though, isn't it? It's a very good quality. Device. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'd but love yeah, to try it. I mean, anything that tracks pitch that well. I mean, that's a tricky. That's a, if you know, mm. it's always hard to do. I mean, I use the MS Twenty. You know, mess around with like things that don't use MIDI essentially because MIDI is a bloody nightmare, obviously, with that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, anything that can track properly is just like wow. That's it's it's impressive. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just trying Very to look cool. see if we've got a decent picture of the resonator somewhere. I think there's not. There's lots of awards, rewards, and stuff in it. I mean, it's kind of classic synth nerd um, synth nerd stuff, but it's very hard to see. It's very hard to see the exact controls on it. Uh, I don't know. Oh, I mean, oh, yeah, sorry. I know that wasn't me. <laughs> oh, okay. I beg your pardon. Uh, Mark, I'm guessing, again, this is, you know, this sort of unusual and uh, unique technology. I, I don't know if they're ever going to make it again or whether it's even viable, but it's, uh, or who holds the patents, you know, because these things do have a habit of shifting around and being sold on and whatnot, but it looks kind of cool, right? It depends who he was making it for, doesn't it? If he was making it for himself or to, for his for his own company, then I guess she 
would hold the patent, wouldn't you? Maybe um, so. It looks... I love stuff like this. Uh, um, uh, any pedals that I can plug my guitar into that don't have to rely on a MIDI pickup always interest me. And anything that can change the guitar signal from sounding like a guitar into actually sounding believably like square wave triangle and filters and being able to get some kind of synth output from a guitar without having to do MIDI always interests me. So it, it's... Uh, I'd like to plug my guitar into one and try one. I've never seen one. It's oh, I, here we go. I've I'm got looking a bigger picture the, of it here. There we go. There's a bigger picture. Yeah, so they, it looks like it's got uh, VCOs and it's also got a uh, timbral image modulator. Gosh, let's see. We, I could get. I know, yeah, I've got. Bit. I've actually found the email chain from 2015, where and um, it came with a pedal board called the Hexinator. Cool. Wow. <laughs> and it would be a like name. kind of a neutron biphase kind of thing. That imp yeah, they... implies that it has six inputs, though, doesn't it? The hexinator, because all the MIDI guitar stuff is always hex on the six strings, right? Maybe, yeah. So, right. so did it need a special... Because yeah, she's playing a Roman G700 guitar, isn't she? Well, I'm looking You're at right. the, front, the, the panel here. Uh, there's basically inputs for a sensitivity for wind all or guitar uh tuning uh very pad it's hard to know exactly what all of that's oh look, it looks like there's some sort of modulation there it looks even like pulse width there is some pulse width there which i'm obviously very pleased Whoa. about uh, that's kind of cool <laughs> it does look I, I mean i imagine these are rare as you know there must be very few of them ever made uh it by the, it was looking like the the guy they built it with uh she she went to see it was one of the guys behind the mutron which was obviously a big yeah. Uh, oh. Sonic shaper of the time, you know, a lot yeah. of the Stevie Wonder sounds and that that kind of fuzz, uh, fuzz yeah, he, um, follower. I think he took it apart with her and basically rebuilt it to get it back and functioning. I think they, I think they got five functioning ones that they had in the end. And yeah, he was part of this, and he he's he, I think he's been really instrumental in in getting the original back working, which is really cool. Um, but, and going back to what Jamie was saying about the, you know, the tracking on this, it's got to be for these sort of things to work really well. And I'm totally with Mark on this because I've tried MIDI guitars and things like that before, and they can be right pain. But I think they built their own bespoke chip f just for the pitch tracking for this ah, particular okay. thing as He well. invented so, the algorithm, I believe. I, he, he had a specific yeah. algorithm that he put in there. So the DFA I, microchip processor. One of there we go. Wow. Exactly. I found the email chain from 2015, so they've always, they've been going on on this one for a long time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I've got a mail from Alison Table. Crazy. It's a, it's a great little story, really, isn't it? I mean, something like this, and I'm totally behind this. I hope I hope they they hit the Kickstarter on this. I think as they go up, I think there's something about a dad also was writing a musical of some sort, and that's if you get to the higher sort of pledges on the Kickstarter, there's she's going to employ someone basically to recompose this using the resynthesizer um uh, and bring that to oh, life right. as well. Yeah, I hope she hears this. It looks really cool. Yeah. And uh yeah she's you a could cool get, kid, uh, isn't she? I mean, she's, yeah you could get spend a day yeah. in Los Angeles recording with the original resonator. Uh Wicked. yeah there's a bunch nice of looking Kickstarter. Yeah, that's good. It's, it's nicely done. I, I wish her all the best. Uh, in fact, we um, she was over here um, talking to Peter Gabriel, uh, I think last year, and um, Dickie Chappell, Peter's uh, guy, said, oh, she wants to come over and see us. And we just couldn't make it work because she was going somewhere and I had to be somewhere else. And we just couldn't because she was going to come into the studio and we were going to get to see it. But it just didn't happen for, you know, logistically, it was all a bit last minute and we couldn't make it work out, which is a real shame because I'd love to have seen that. But uh, you can kickstart it now. You just, it's re Resynator. So R-E-S-Y-N-A-T-O-R. If you look for that, you'll find it and you can kickstart. You can, uh, you know, do the kickstart Join thing. In. Wow. Um, right. So, um, uh, oh yeah, this was another thing that I thought was kind of interesting. This was, uh, I was looking at, uh, it was quite a slow news week. I have to be honest because it's post NAM. People are sort of waiting for, I think they're waiting for either Synthplex and then, uh, um, uh, Ooh, Super Booth, which is coming up. And this is uh, Press and News Europe. Uh, Phil Ward, who's a great journalist, uh, top chap, he wrote an article about, because um, everybody's using in-ear monitoring, um, you know, pretty much exclusively. And it's getting to the point, but it's creating these kind of weird 
sort of specific sets of situations where you've got all this energy happening on stage, but very little noise, particularly if people are using electronic triggers and whatnot. And it, it, it started to turn, I mean, while it's great and lots of people swear by it, it creates this sort of almost a sense of isolation to a degree because everybody becomes fixated on their own in-ear mix because it can get so good that you can almost have like the vibe, the, 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 the mix of the track that you want that vibes you up. But it's very insular. Um, and the idea of having some actual air movement Moving on the stage is sort of being lost and it, it, it kind of his argument is that you know perhaps it loses some of the vibe and you know one of those things um why uh in-ear monitoring is working is because we don't have to take so much stuff makes it easier for the sound guy means you don't have to carry so much equipment which means it's cheaper to tour so all of these financial considerations but ultimately you know it's nice to have a bit of i'll, I'll come to you first jay because you perform yeah. periodically and on various oh, yeah. various oh, stages yeah. you know of, of differing sizes and whatnot i mean Presumably, True. you've experienced both sides of this equation. What, what is it that you? How do you feel about it? Uh, yeah, it, well, I always remember tour, touring. I opened for Elton John for a whole European tour, and uh, I was always like, I noticed that he he just was old school wedges, right? Do you know what I mean? And after all this time, I kind of thought, well, Elton knows something, doesn't he? You know, <laughs> about like keeping the vibe alive like literally like after all this time it's still still going out and rocking so uh i i, I know it's it, it's tricky it's definitely you sort of get used to the in-ears but i think that's the expression you know you just get used to it it's not and i think for certain situations it's absolutely critical it, those times when we were playing with elton and there would be like you know birmingham nec and all these bloody massive venues if you were going wedges you really have to stand right in front of the wedge because if you leave the wedge's little radiant zone, you're in a world of reverb hell, basically. And you can't yeah, time, okay. you can't pitch, you can't do a yeah. damn thing. As a singer, for example, that's it's critical. Like it, like on a big stage, you love the in-ears. It's pretty hard to... Because otherwise, you've really got to be standing right in front of the wedge so you can't move around. So, you know... If you like to run about a bit with a wireless and that's kind of a laugh, you need in ears. But at the same time, it's definitely a bit of a buzzkill. I agree, and it's sort of like there is. And but at the same time, I I used to find well, you can kill your ears either way. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, in ears, well, you can really creep up the volume and go yeah, and then you realise you're on like nine on the pack, and it's just like if you actually listen to that in the cold, if you put it on first thing in the morning, you'd just be like afraid. And there, but then same thing goes for the wedges. People have them like brutal levels. Like some DJs have like two crazy like wedges at ear height either side of the thing, and they're just pumping as loud as possible. I worry about people's ears, man. You know, it's like it's not yeah. cool. So whatever looks after right. your ears. Mm. Yeah, go that's a good that point. Way. That's a good point. Uh, there were some really interesting strategies they had in this as well. Which, uh, if I could just jump in there, a you just have in ears and subs. So the subs kick, they move yeah. the air around the stage. So you feel that the bass. And the other thing was, is what they were doing is they have uh, intercommunication between the bands. So every band member has a mic and there's a proximity sensor. So you can reach up to it and just sort of say, oh, let's do that again. Or yeah, to, you know, hit that snare or whatever it may be that you want to shout out to your band members. So there's, there, there, but there are two routes of communication. You have one, which is proximity, which is talks to everybody. And one with a foot switch, which just talks to the monitor engineer saying, I need a, I need something to change here. And, and creating, I mean, I mean, it, it seems to be massively complex. Cool. It's complex, but it, it's an interesting kind of, uh, idea that having to replace all that communication. I know Mark, I mean, you've toured, you know, you, I guess, from a technical point of view, in ears must be a lot easier because it's a fixed system that you know, you know, it's I going think to work pretty much every night, right? It, it, it well, we, yes. I'm just going to talk about the article. Uh, I, uh, I'll answer differently to what the question you know, you've asked me. I think this article mentions a guy called John Burton, but I think that's actually Don Burton because Donnie Burton was. Um, our stage manager with Duran Duran in 1993 when the Cranberries um, supported and Duran had at that point that they weren't going to have any monitors on stage at all because they had a set designed by a guy called Stefano Slather oh, just think, designer yeah. and there's just nowhere to put monitors so we had uh, we were rehearsing in a place in Santa Monica and there was nothing on stage 
in terms of uh, foldback at all. Everyone had in ears. All you could hear was uh, someone padding on the drums, uh, Warren's high heel boots running up and down this ramp, and kind of the a, a little bit of kind of quiet strings <laughs> from the guitar, and then Simon hollering over the top of it, and it sounded weird as hell. It re- and it didn't last long. I have to say. I think we toured like that for about three months and everybody hated it and the wedges eventually came back and everybody wanted like some kind of proper fold back as well as the ear. Oh, yeah. But actually having the wedges on the stage, was, and I think it is the vibration on the stage that is the most important thing because otherwise you've got no... You might just as well be listening to a Walkman. And I think the compression that happens in the in-ear systems actually messes with the dynamics of the band. And what Donnie says in that article is correct. It's that like the band loses ability to sense the dynamics of the other players and then the whole thing flattens out and starts yeah, yeah. to sound a bit kind of, I don't know, uh, less lively, let's yeah. say. That's an interesting thing. Even that was in my studio, experience. Even in the, yeah, I mean, a related phenomenon that happens in the studio and it's something I did, I was recording, I just produced a new album for Alan Stone, which will be coming out this year. And uh, one of the things that we ended up doing is a real old Nashville technique. You don't use headphones. We just track the whole thing with no headphones. You just pump the vocal through a little PA in the room and you just track it with, was, you know, you don't care. I was going to say that about... It's amazing what we do because no one's in headphones and everyone's actually listening <laughs> to the same thing. Sorry, mate. I was, was going to say that about Elton as well because when um, my brother did an Elton John remix, they sent us the master tape and I had that up in Brit Row and I listened to the master vocal and I was like, hang on a minute, something's really wrong here. This can't be the lead vocal. So I went back to the record company and the original engineer and said, can you send me the proper lead vocal? Because this vocal's got piano and everything all over it. And when they went, no, no, that's the vocal. So as far as I could tell, he recorded the yeah. lead vocal on, and I can't remember the name of the song, with all the fold back on in the room yeah. and without headphones on to get the dynamic again, I guess. Apparently. That's good. I mean, that's, right. no, that, that's interesting. I don't know. Sorry, Matt, you haven't haven't uh, come in on this. I mean, I guess in ear monitoring and modular stuff is probably not something you'd want so much because of the you, you want to feel it, the air move, it, right? It depends. Yeah, I guess like uh, like uh, Jamie was saying, you know, I've played before where you've got wedges either side of your head, which is just essentially two massive speakers pumping really loud. I'm not into that at all. Um, no. I tend to use ears definitely for this and i have it nice and quiet and that's just so i know what's going on because i think one of the biggest problems with wedges is the quality of them and i was touring a lot last year um one half of, of a group called knightstown and a lot of the venues we played the, the wedges were just really poor and battered and the yeah. beer spilled over them over about 20 years and they were dinted and tweeters didn't work and this that and the other so you're trying to monitor on on its really poor quality yeah. monitoring systems and and that makes it really tough and that's when you start overcompensating with volume and and things like that so we went to in ears which just allowed us to have things nice and quiet as long you've just got to be careful not to pump it too much and then we would use the wedges to uh, create bass movement on the stage so you've got that relationship with what's going on externally because it really can cut you off when you've got those in ears going on. So it's just trying to find the best of both worlds, really, and looking after your hearing. And um, the bottom line is, you, as long as you can give that performance to the to the crowd, um, that, that's the important thing. And pitching vocals and things like that, obviously, is super duper important. You've got to be able to hear that crystal clear at all times. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree. Also, the in ears, yeah, no, that's right. No, quite, that's for- quite right. It's interesting what you were saying about having the vocals and, and that spill that you get. It's actually a, an art that I think is very much lost. And I, I, um, when I was, you know, I was doing remixing in the past, and we'd get various tracks in, and it would always be very nicely isolated. Then once we got asked to remix, um, oh god, Casey and the Sunshine Band, get down tonight, and they sent us the multi-track for that. I've told this story before, and literally, it's sort of everything is part of everything. So yeah. there, there is, there's very little spill, but you just think, well, how do you get all that top end on a vocal? Because if you've got half of the other stuff coming down it as well, you're also EQing that. So that would affect how you would EQ those instruments with it. And the stereo, I just don't, I mean, it's an art form, I mean, imagine, because well, I mean, I certainly wouldn't know how to do it. 
we do the vocals sometimes in the control room through the main speakers, um, handheld microphone, so that the singer can just get into it and then flip the phase on that vocal recording. Yeah, yeah. Speakers and we've got our X now, anyway. We can yeah. fix it all with our X, can't well, we? That's true, yeah. That too, yeah. Use our X. A beautiful thing. You don't need to remove it. Look, I'm yeah, there, man. I'm out of I've had like a fancy U47 or whatever. Someone wants the headphones so bloody loud. By the time you're listening to the bleed on a U47, it's comparable yeah. to the bleed on an SM7 with the speakers on, yeah. Because right, you yeah. actually You've got such a sensitive body sound to with. Control, yeah. like listening like crazy and it's a disgusting sound the sound of the the limited frequency of a spill out the can you know out the back of a headphone i'd rather hear full yeah, frequency yeah. out of speak but the thing so, is that, mean, that the phone but the phase thing only works if you're using all the other stuff. <laughs> if you just want the vocal, you can't flip the phase on the vocal because all the stuff that's going down it is not in the mix anymore because you might have remixed it completely. So it's, it makes, I mean... Plus, you need to have the speakers in mono, don't you, for that trick? Don't Because if you're getting delay uh, from left and right speakers, then that's you're, probably very you're true. catching a weird comb filter thing or something. Yeah, that's I've right, tried it. It does work. Mono. Yeah, it does work. Well, I did it with backing vocals. We had about 20 people in the room and then we had to record the track back through the room. So the trick is you record the vocalist singing into the mic and then you just get everybody to stand there and then you play the track back into the room and then you reverse the phase of the track in the room against the recorded vocal with the track in the room. And then that takes the track in the room out. If you move all the people, it completely messes it up. So you, if, if yeah, you've got that's amazing. Back that's, back, that's an so interesting that's idea. Amazing. So you record a phase reverse track so that you can use that in the mix later. Yeah, and it just everybody <laughs> has to stand still and be quiet. Oh wow! Well, you that's... could use you could create amazing phasing effects just by slightly changing what's going on in the room and use it deliberately as an effect, and then shimmer it. I'm I'm liking <laughs> the amazing phasing. Amazing <laughs> phasing. That's a, that's got a nice bit of alliteration to it as well. Amazing oh person. man, it's his quality. Yeah, that, but uh, you know, all of oh, it's so many singers just like to have the speakers on, right? Yeah, the well, I think it makes a big difference. It, it does. It makes a really big difference, and I think it's probably for everybody. You know, the and I always used to feel really sorry for when the uh, you know back when you'd be a new band going into the studio and the way that it was done back then was you build the click track, the drummer would play the drums. And there'd be totally. nothing for them to go off. I mean, you'd have that, you know, and then they figured out that what you do is you have the band in the control room giving it some so that the drummer's got something to go against. But if you've just got the drums in the room, it's it, there's nothing, there's nothing there for them to feed off. And it's, it's incredibly uh, revealing and it's, uh, it's, it's quite stressful. For that's the why they people. never did that in all of the great recordings, Motown and all that. Yeah, of course. Everyone yeah. playing yeah. together. Sort of job done. <laughs> Remember yeah. that, guys? Yeah, because we're absolutely. so afraid of bleed, because the 80s taught us that bleed is bad, but it's a complete lie. And the thing, people need to embrace bleed and just love it because, you know, we don't need to live in the 80s anymore. We should act in a world that is so isolated already with the internet. I think we should compel as much community as possible. Open Ditch the doors. The in the studio, all play live <laughs> and just record all the <laughs> And then shimmer it, obviously. Yeah, Needless well, wise words, wise words. I think that's a yeah. fair enough thing to say, actually. Um, it always just... struck me as odd in the 80s that we used to spend all our time taking all the reverb off everything and trying to get everything as dry as possible, only to put this, like, completely synthetic, whatever it was at the time, at least it's uh, microverb Maybe. or something, I think it was, <laughs> back on it to make it sound like it was in a natural space. Except that listening back to any of those recordings I did then, they just sound awful. <laughs> But the reverbs are so unbelievably poor. Yeah, well, yeah, that, yeah. they they were, um, but then they were also they were also divine. all we could afford until we the went. Great into the British studio. Spring. That was the the, the, the one. The, the train fight. <laughs> well, I think um, I, I think that feels like quite. Uh, I, I did. There were some other sort of topics, but uh, to be honest, it feels like that's a good place to uh, to, to drop things off. Unless anybody was really excited about uh, the uh, the other the other topic we were talking about. Sorry, Matt. I was about the uh, the SoundCloud thing, but we can leave Sa that. SoundCloud. Oh uh, well, let, let's do that. The, what the SoundCloud and SoundMarker. This is news. Um, yeah. We'll just pop this in. There's news. SoundCloud in their continuing kind of uh, attempt to sort of be the destination for audio stuff because at the moment, you know, everybody's just uploading stuff to YouTube and 
play music like that. But SoundCloud sort of there needs to be a platform really where music makers can uh, get that level of distribution and sharing. And SoundCloud have added. Uh, let me see if I go to here on the SoundCloud Premiere. You get. Uh, you can connect it to other uh, resources. So upload yeah. it there and you get uh, access to uh, Amazon Music, uh, Apple uh, Apple Music, Instagram, YouTube Music and Spotify distribution. So you can do the whole thing in one place, which seems like quite a good idea. I mean, I, 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 I sort of went off Spotify after there were there were just sort of things that we used to use it and it was great, but then it got really complicated for, for a podcast. It's pointless because you pay sort of by the minute and we record an hour a week and it's just not affordable. It wasn't, it didn't make any sense, but Matt, you, 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 you could speak up for this because uh, you said you're excited. Yeah. I just thought it was really interesting for seven pound 50 a month. You can basically upload as much as you want and it will distribute this. So it becomes an aggregator basically, and it will put it on all of the, all of the main, um music channels like apple music and spotify and what have you and that's just amazing and, and i know spotify recently they did a beta where you could do the same thing where you can just from your bedroom upload your music to spotify and it's on there and 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 they're beta doing that but for soundcloud to take this step forward is really good because up until now as well you've you've never been paid for any money any music that's played on or streamed on soundcloud which I know there's yeah. ways around. Ultimately, they're playing your music, and there should be maybe you should maybe be uh, financially recompensed for that. But they're taking steps towards this now, and I, th I think this is because um, SoundCloud were took over by another another group, and I think or, or new management or something like that. And I think this is a really interesting direction of taking it. SoundCloud has also, for me, been one of those places where you, there's not many people that I know who are just the average listener will just go to SoundCloud to check out new music. SoundCloud is almost a platform for music producers to listen to other mm. music producers' music. Yeah. That's the way I've always seen it. And this might turn that around a little bit and become an environment for, for non-music producers to go to SoundCloud and start listening to music on there. But the fact that you can just get your stuff, you've got scheduled releases, you've got stats that you can access, um, uh, you can replace tracks. You can turn tracks on and off as well from the aggregates. Um, it's really good. So up until now, you've been using things like DistroKid, CD Baby, all those kind of aggregates to get your music out there. Well, I'm wondering what that means for them as well, because they used to be the middlemen, and now the middlemen are sort of out of the way because you can just pump your music up there. It does also mean as well that all of these online streaming platforms are going to be absolutely full of everything from – you know, yeah. people who just <laughs> listened to a garage band and started learning how to use a few loops. And then well, that's true. I mean, you know. I suppose the problem is, is in the consumption point of view that we, we've got all these competing services. You know, you might have a subscription to Apple Music, you might have a su subscription to Amazon Music or Spotify. I mean, though, that's 40 quid a month, more or less, mm. right? Or 30 quid a month right there, yeah. right away. If you add SoundCloud to that, I mean, who's going to be, you know, it's... It, it, you sort of almost want a single destination, don't you? Because, I mean, SoundCloud, as you say, makes sense for uh, um, the uploader, but not necessarily the consumer. Because if I had to pay to access the consumption of SoundCloud, then it's sort of like, it's just yet another thing, you know, another platform that I've then got that yeah. I then got to pay for, which it, it, it all starts to add up. It's, it's kind of like cable TV, you know, it's like, I'd just rather just pay for my yeah. telly and decide what I want rather than have to have that Netflix and Prime and blah, 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 all these different things. And it's just competing for meager resources. And, and most people, as we know, aren't really prepared to pay that much for music. And uh, how many, um, how many views do you, or listens do you think they have to have on Spotify to earn seven pound 50 then? So oh, I've got well, my, a, a lot do you think? Of course. Do you think enough people could listen to my song in a month to pay my seven pound fifty back? No. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I no. I knew it. No. That's it. Man. I mean, that's that's a fair yeah. argument. That is a, that, I'm sure Ed Sheeran's doing all right, actually. 
Yeah, well, exactly. But that's what it happens. But the thing is, the reason that that happens also is because of the way that it's divvied up. It's divvied up as a sort of, it's almost like the electoral college uh, uh, method of counting votes, where it's like, well, you're really big, so you get a bigger percentage. It's not actually all, as far as I understand, it's not completely down to plays. It's like, you know, Beyonce and Ed Sheeran and a few others will get big slices of it based on really? sampling statistics. I don't think it's purely... They've got enough money. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. All right, Jamie, you're on Walkabout. We're having a tour. I like your... Walkabout, yeah. We're having a little tour, yeah. You want to see? Like, uh, you can't really see. It's beautiful, actually. It's <laughs> lovely, yeah. These Adobe houses are really the way. We, we, uh, we'd we love to live in one, but, you know, you can't do it in Nashville, really. It rains too much. Oh, God, uh, yeah. yeah it'll just wash away. <laughs> It'll just waterproofing away, yeah, the yeah, yeah, you can't really do too much. Pretty yeah. Pretty yeah. Glaring. But yeah, we we we're about to drive six hours to Sedona, Arizona. <laughs> wow! So, so uh, but yeah, it's been great to see you lot again. Well, I'm glad. And, to, I'm uh, glad you could make it. Always yeah, Ace. I you. mean, I, I I do. I do this this idea of making back any money on streaming is definitely something that I can. I mean, my, the majority of what I'm trying to do these days is co-write, and you know, much that I love doing it, it's it's uh it's hard. It's hard to make money with the streaming stuff. I really do hope it turns a corner, and you know, it you know you can make a living from it. That that would be fair, a happy place. Musicians yeah. really ought to get paid for writing music, oughtn't they? I mean, that's the bottom line. <laughs> I mean, I, big I, companies I, coming along and going, "Oh, we'll just have a big cut of that." Someone else will have a big cut of that. Someone else, and the musicians generally end up with zero. So you go, well, "Oh, here's your royalty you. statement. You earned twenty-two thousand pounds, and we took." 11,000 and they took 9,000 and they took 3,000 and you owe us four pounds 37. It's like, <laughs> hey, how did that happen? Ah, yeah. Uh, Maybe, yeah, let's not get started on that. That's difficult. I know, exactly. It's a, it's a shimmer. Can, how do we fix it? The, well, it's I true. think the way is you see the streaming as, as a way to engage with an audience, build an audience over time. Once you've got that audience, yeah. you take you take it away from streaming. Once you've got an audience that you can then take to your own place, your own website, your own Patreon, your own gateway, mm -hmm. you can then start True. generating in that way. So at the, to begin with, you've just got to play the game. You've got to build that audience first. And the only way to build the audience yeah. is to use the best tools that can get you out there. So I see it as a, a gateway. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. Okay, well, I think we'll okay. we'll I think it's time we wrapped up. But uh, well, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. I hope your thank drive you is, uh, yeah, is is is, is, is uh, picturesque and un uneventful. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see you again. Hopefully, maybe in yeah. another wooden location. Yeah, I like the sound of that. Anyway, thank okay. you very much for joining us, Jamie. Don't forget to check out Jamie's uh, podcasts on uh, Jamie Lou Music. Right Have there, fun with that shimmer. Lot, lots of good stuff there. Uh, and also, Thank Mr. You. Mark Tinley, thanks for joining us too. Um, find out about what Mark's up at sonusmagus.com. I hope you feel better soon and you can get back in the shop and do what you love doing. Yep. You're very welcome. Always a pleasure. And I will, uh, I'll will i probably see you in about six months next time I'm dying, maybe. You know, <laughs> no, you know. Hopefully before then, I'm sure. Anyway, thank you we very can, much. Maybe we could do a special in the new shop. Maybe I should actually have an opening ceremony after two and a half years. Or whatever. Maybe so. An opening yeah, party. Not? That's a good idea. Yeah, maybe I will. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, nice All right, thank you, Mark. And I'll also, you uh, <laughs> Mr. Matthew Hodson, thank you for joining us too. Um, you stream it much me. live on YouTube? You doing them? You, anybody can check you out on uh, YouTube, Matthew Hodson, right? Uh, yeah, just just go to my street. There's loads of streams up there at the minute. Um, I haven't been doing any this year just because I've been in writing stage and uh, planning lots of gigs. I was hoping to tell you about a load of gigs today over in uh, both America and Berlin this year, but I, cool. I can't. I'll have to do that next time because the ink's still drying so i'll let you know about that oh brilliant that sounds great anyway yeah. folks uh, that's it for this time we'll we'll oh look he's gone outside and everything we'll see you all next time thank I'm you very much for joining out. us take care Let's try to get the whole <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye.